Sir David King, could you stand up, please? Mr. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, distinguished platform guests, proud parents, relative friends, and most important of all, graduating students. I have the honor of presenting the citation for the awarding of the honorary degree of Doctor of Science to our guest, Professor Sir David King, Fellow of the Royal Society of London. Now, this is a joyous occasion, so we shouldn't be too serious. I shall call him Dave. <laughs> it's not often that one has a distinguished guest, old friend, and colleague at one's mercy. But Sir David can rest assured that I will be gentle. But he may be a little embarrassed at the fulsome praise it was interesting, the talk he gave this morning, some of the themes came out, and he gave an absolutely inspiring talk. Today he's restricted to 10 minutes, so I think he'll still inspire you. We live in an age in which evidence-based decision-making seems to be continuously under attack, especially where it conflicts with short-term economic or societal factors. At the same time, there has never been a more critical need for men and women with the relevant educational backgrounds and dedication to tackle our profound global challenges, such as climate change, which threaten our very survival. I can think of no one who has better demonstrated the broadly based vision, wisdom and leadership necessary to face these challenges than our honorary Professor Sir David King, FRS. I will henceforth refer to him as Dave as he is a friend and colleague of about 40 years standing. A few personal words are in order. Dave was born in Durban, South Africa, educated in Johannesburg and at Witwatersrand University. Dave was a staunch opponent of apartheid, and I underspeak myself if I say perhaps this was the primary cause of his emigration to the United Kingdom. In fact, I think a boot was delivered, right? South Africa's loss was the United Kingdom's gain, the world's gain, actually, as I think we'll see. He became a lecturer at what was then a new university, the University of East Anglia in Norwich, Norfolk, coincidentally close to where I was born and lived as a child. He rapidly established a world-leading group in the science of surfaces, an area that enjoyed a golden age during his career, one that I shared with him, that now underpins much such 21st century technologies as nanotechnology, the science of the very small, amongst many other areas. His scientific career led him to the Professorship of Physical Chemistry at the University of Liverpool, from there to Cambridge, where he became chemistry department head, it's the leading department in the UK, master of Downing College, Yes, it is the same Downing as Downing Street with the Prime Minister's residences in England. And he, became, he was master of Downing College. He led a, a group widely recognized as the best in the UK and thus the equal of any in the world. And I speak with considerable inside knowledge of that. He really was a wonderful scientist. He's published over 500 papers and including leading texts on environmental science issues, which I think are used here. Dave has always been engaged in politics and the role that science plays in society. Here's another message for you guys. He developed close interactions with the new Labour Party and his wisdom, and I use that word advisedly, wisdom, not just knowledge, his wisdom and abilities were recognized by his appointment as Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government of Tony Blair from 2000 to 2007. He had an immediate impact on the government's awareness of many issues, among which climate change is the single most important challenge facing humanity. The importance of evidence-based decision-making was further demonstrated by his leadership in the control of the catastrophic foot and mouth outbreak in the UK in which modeling of the spread of the disease was critical. This is using his knowledge and wisdom outside his immediate area. 
Dave's commitment to fighting climate change led him to become the founding director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at Oxford University, where he also established the World Forum on Enterprise and the Environment. Parenthetically, Dave, I now wonder who you cheer for in the Oxford and Cambridge boat race. In 2013, he became the special representative on climate change in the office of the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary in the UK government, William Hague, thereby joining, according to some of his friends, the dark side of the political spectrum. They knew that he was, uh, um, a, 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 I'm searching for words, a Labour Party card holder, worked with Tony Blair, they recognized again his qualities and took him into that office where again he's had enormous influence. He is similarly involved as chair with a program called the Future Cities Catapult. And what connects all of these activities is his passionate belief that we must change how we do things on both a global and a local scale. You guys should take this message home with you that this is enormously important. His enormous energy and abilities to educate and achieve consensus among states and nations via his wise counsel, and not least, as the people that heard him this morning can attest by his eloquence and charm, can be encapsulated by his success in brokering the decision as to where to site the largest nuclear fusion experiment, the international thermonuclear thing, the Americans do it with lasers, the Europeans and Japanese are trying to do it with the tokamak, magnetic confinement. He brokered that. And when you understand that both France and England wanted it, if you understand the history between England and France, you can understand what an achievement that was. These activities have won him many awards. A knighthood in 2003, foreign fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2002, and more recently, an appointment as an officier dans l'Ordre National de la Légion d'Honneur, from France, of course. He now has a bucket load of honorary degrees from around the world. And until recently, he was Chancellor of the University of Liverpool. So in summary, he's a role model of how a wise, dedicated, passionate scientist can change the world using the knowledge and wisdom derived from an inquiring, analytical, and fair mind. His career is something that this graduating class should strive to emulate in the service of humanity. We are honored to count him as an alumnus of Western University. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, and in the name of the Senate, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa upon Professor Sir David A. King. By virtue of the authority vested in me as Chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. Congratulations, Dr. King. On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Sir David King, to address convocation, Dr. King. Chancellor, academics and support staff, and of course, again, particularly the graduates, the graduands, you're not yet graduates, uh, 
When a university of the international standing of Western includes you amongst their distinguished graduates at this ceremony, you are justified, I think, in indulging in a small degree of self-satisfaction, uh, even self-congratulation, and certainly of celebration. You, through your hard work and, of course, your individual accomplishments, uh, have, have really deserved it. Uh, for me to be included with you uh, in this distinguished company is a very real honor. And Chancellor, to the university, I really am enormously grateful for that. I'm also, of course, particularly grateful to Peter Norton for his, his kind and somewhat over-generous words. Peter, thank you for that. For each succeeding generation of graduates, and this is what university education is all about, the world presents a new series of uh, opportunities uh, and challenges. That is the non-static part of the process. But I want to suggest that today, these opportunities and challenges are qualitatively different from those that we faced in the 20th century. I've only got a few minutes to make that argument, but let me try. The 20th century was a century of amazing successes from the endeavors of science, engineering, technology, medicine, social sciences, arts, and humanities. And we can measure those successes by how they played out in terms of improved human well-being across the world. So if I say, well, one measure of that human well-being is lifespan. So lifespan increased from an average at the beginning of the 20th century of about 40 in the Western world to about 80 uh, at the end of that century, and still rising. Massive success. And another way of measuring that success is actually the demographics. So that rapid rise in the human population from one and a half billion to six billion through that century, I'm going to suggest is another measure of those successes. Why do I say that? Because as human lifespan increases, many more children survive into maturity. And if children survive into maturity, they too have children, and so we get population explosion. And so what happened to create a sort of hangover in the 21st century is that population growth that was a result of our successes. So I'm not criticizing population growth, I'm taking it as a measure of that success. And another measure of success is that actually the issue of population growth is now rapidly coming under control. So in the mid-15th mid, uh, to 17th century in Britain, just to take one country example that I know rather well, the average woman had seven to eight children. But of those seven to eight children, only two lived into maturity. And then when you get this rapid improvement in human well-being delivered by all those institutional improvements that I've indicated, coupled with the Industrial Revolution, you suddenly find within two generations, all six, seven children are surviving into maturity. Now, the response is interesting because it, there's an almost natural response, country by country, that the number of children per woman falls rapidly in the third generation, on average, close to two. In other words, uh, Chancellor, no credit to the males in the audience. Uh, the, the women seem to know what to do to have two children who will survive into maturity. So we end up in the situation we're in today where, on average, a woman has 2.2 children for the whole planet. I'm including the whole planet in that figure. And 2.1 gives us a stable population. So we female education, female empowerment, and the availability of contraceptives has completely overcome the actual population growth problem. Not completely, much more work to be done. But we are closing in on that. So what are we left with? What we're left with is another demographic challenge, which is the big one. And that is the rapid growth in the people on the planet's surface, who I'm going to describe as middle class, because I can't find another phrase that well describes it. I'm describing the middle class people. I suspect you're all middle class. 
um, as those who spend between ten and a hundred dollars a day. The number who spend that amount per day was just on one billion in the year 2000. We doubled that number to two billion last year. We now have two billion middle class people. And by 2030, the demographic trend is that we'll be closing in on five billion. Good news, that means that we've gone from one sixth of the human population living as well as you do to two sevenths today and it'll be five eighths by 2030 if all goes well, and that's a big if. Now, the challenge that I'm referring to as the big new challenge for all of us is can the planet deliver the commodities that the middle class expects to have and at the level of expectation as we move forward over the next 30 to 40 years? And there's the biggest challenge of all. Not only the commodities, so I'm talking about food, energy, minerals, water. We're, we're stressing capabilities around the production of each of these. We are not using enough of that brilliance, that human brilliance that we always bring to these problems. And that's why this is the right audience for me to be addressing. We need the brilliant minds of today emerging from our universities to sort the problems out that we've left from the 20th century. But in addition to the issue of commodities, I'm going to suggest there is a major crisis around what we are doing to our ecosystems. And we, we just need to try to remember that we co-evolved with our ecosystem. The reason why the atmosphere has just the right amount of oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide for us to live in and for plants to grow in is not coincidental. It's because we all co-evolved with the plant matter, with the geological systems, with the oceans. We co-evolved into this ecosystem. We are one thread of that major ecosystem. And yet, actually, I suspect from the, the roots of the Industrial Revolution, we have begun to divorce the notion of man and people from nature. We see them as separate entities. The Romantic movements, the poets of the Romantic movement, and I'm talking about Wordsworth and Keats and Byron and so on, they understood what was happening. And they were trying to focus humanity back into understanding that we were a part of nature and to appreciate that part of nature. Now, the point I'm making, of course, is that if we damage the ecosystems that give us our means of survival, we're actually committing a joint kind of suicide. This is an existential threat that we're under. And it's a question now of our ability to take collective action to manage that. When I say collective action, and I'm now traveling the world with these messages. Collective ac action actually means that our political system needs to acknowledge that we need to work together, to work collectively on these issues. We, I repeat, have the intelligence. We often have all the technologies. But do we have the collective capability to make all the adjustments required to take us safely through this century? In other words, I think we can do it, but we can only do it if you put your minds to it. And I'm, I'm suggesting by this not that it's just a technological issue. It's a human behavior issue. And so those of you who are graduating in the arts and humanities, just as important as technology to understand uh, where I'm going with this. I, I do feel that we need to reinvent the future. We cannot repeat the mistakes of the 20th century, we need to learn from them. We have together to reinvent the 21st century, a 21st century in which hopefully, instead of focusing on consumerism to create improved well-being, which is what my thesis is, we go into super consumerism, which is actually then self-destructive. If we keep the linear economy of the last century, in which we take commodities, put them into the marketplace, and then throw them away as waste, we're not going to manage. If we learn this new phrase, the circular economy, where there is no waste, think of nature, there's no waste in nature, everything is reused. We need to get back 
to that state of living with nature. Now, if that sounds a bit heavy, let me, let me say uh, it is a bit heavy. I'm not trying to lighten the, the burden here. And I'm also going to suggest that each one of us is responsible. Society is made up of us individuals, and each one of us has a responsibility. So I, I end with a quotation from uh, Voltaire. If, if you're ever short of an aphorism, go to Voltaire. He has one for every occasion. Uh, and this one, I will just end with this quotation, is no snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. Thank you.